And so I'd like all of you to join me in welcoming Elissa Nadborny. Hi. <laughs> so um, I'm going to try and make this as kind of informal as possible. I have a lot of stuff I want to tell you, but um, you can shout out questions at me or you can interrupt me with your perspective because you guys are really the experts on this. You see students every day in the classrooms or at school, so um, please feel free to interrupt. Um, it is kind of funny that y'all are sitting so far back, far back and, and spread out. I was kind of, I thought maybe the educators would come up, come up close, but that is not the case. <laughs> um, I'm going to play some audio clips throughout this, so um, just kind of wave your hands in the back if you have trouble hearing, and we'll work on that. I brought uh, my own speaker here so I can have absolute control of the audio clips. Um, well, first, that was a fantastic introduction. I don't really know if I need to say anything else. Um, I cover education for NPR, so often I will be with headphones on, a big furry microphone, probably a camera around my neck, um, in the field talking with folks. My, I, I'm based in Washington, D.C., but I tell stories all across the country, which can be a challenge because a lot of education is local policy or kind of um, what's happening locally or even by state. And my job is to make something interesting for someone sitting on the 405 in California and also on the beach in Rhode Island. So um, that's kind of what I'm tasked to do. Uh, the last year I've spent covering higher education and college access and kind of really trying to hone in on what that means for low-income students. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So one big challenge that I think the media has in covering education is this perception versus reality. I think a lot of people think that the students who go to college are different than the students who actually go to college. Um, and so one of my kind of missions is to change that narrative. So think about how often you hear stories about places like Harvard. Just this week, Harvard's in the news. I mean, Harvard makes up just such a minuscule, a sliver of 1% in who goes to college. Um, you probably know this better than most because you're here at Valencia, but most students are going to open access institutions. They're going to community colleges. They're going to four years. Lots of students have the intention of transferring. So that, those are kind of the stories that I'm interested in telling, and I'm interested in America having a better understanding of like who is really, who is really experiencing higher ed. And then once they think about that, then we can start to think about how can policies change? How can we support that? Um, so this is a story I did uh, about a year ago, last September, um, just looking at the data. Um, this is for all across higher ed, so this is four-year and two-year. Um, but as you can see, I mean, one in five are at least 30 years old, so that's, those are a lot of folks that we don't think of straight from high school. Um, many are first-gen, going to college for the first time, especially as uh, immigrant populations grow. Um, we realized that almost a quarter of the student population were uh, parents. Caregivers? Raising kids? So you, I'm going to talk a little bit about a story we did um, about a mom who just graduated from University of Florida in Gainesville. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Anyway, so, so our sense in kind of doing stories like this is to really try and remind our audience that we're perhaps not thinking about the folks who are actually experiencing college. Let's see. So another big part of my job is to talk about research. Um, so this was a, a story about, um, they found that if students who were going part-time went full-time for just one semester, they were more likely to go the following semester, and then they were more likely to graduate. Um, I don't know if, if, if this resonates at all in terms of the population you serve, but based on the data, lots of students are going part-time. And... We know from this research and others that that can be a real challenge. 
um, a challenge in accumulating enough credits that it adds up to something, and then, especially if we're talking transfer, then the credits count. So the part-time can be a, a real challenge. And so this research I thought was interesting because it showed that there was just a big impact on just one semester. Um, so this is perhaps a conversation about resources. This is a conversation about potentially loans to alleviate having to be able to work, which we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of small federal loans, which I think sometimes gets lost in our crisis of student loan debt. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, so this is kind of an example of a story that I would cover. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about IKEA parks for a little bit. Um, one of my main missions is character-driven stories. I think people respond really well um, when there's a character that you can connect with. I think, actually, if you think about yourselves and why you do your job, it's so that you can connect with students. Like, that's the best part. For me, for sure, the best part is talking to, to students and getting their perspectives and hearing their stories. So um, this is Ikea Park. She was a, when she, she was a first-gen student, she's from Orlando. Um, she didn't know anyone that went to college. Um, she was in a youth group, and the youth pastor suggested that she uh, think about college, and they enrolled her in the AVID program. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and so she, during high school, she worked with a counselor to kind of prep for college. And she was accepted into the University of Florida, and she was part of their first-gen scholarship program, and so she got a full ride. Um, so she moved up to campus. Her mom, her mom's boyfriend, her brother drove her up, moved her into the dorms. She started summer classes. And uh, a few weeks into classes, she started feeling a little bit sick. She thought, oh, maybe campus food is just not sitting with me. Turned out she was pregnant. This was a, just a few weeks into her first set of classes. And so when I talked to her about this and she remembered what it felt like, she told me that she was afraid they would kick her out. She hadn't known anybody who went to college, let alone someone who went to college while having a kid. And so she just assumed that if, if she let people know, it just it wasn't going to work out. And so she was kind of filled with dread and disappointment, and um, she felt like she was letting a lot of people down. Um, but she had a really great mentor, and this is something that we, comes up in research a lot, that just one connection with an adult, you guys, can make a really, really big difference for a student. And that mentor, the person who was her advisor who had been assigned through the university, happened to be also pregnant. <laughs> and so she, her advisor kind of helped her figure out how she could take off a semester, go home, give birth in Atlanta, er, Orlando, and um, come back to campus. And what's really incredible about this is that the faculty member, the advisor, also came back from maternity leave, same time that Ikea came back to campus. So I'm going to play a little bit from my time with Ikea. So she, after giving birth back in Orlando, she went back to the university. After Ikea Parks gave birth to a healthy baby boy, she decided to come back. Go for him. Hey. Her son, Caleb, is now a rambunctious, happy three-year-old. <laughs> Coming back to school as a single mom, it was the most difficult thing she's ever done. Everything was harder. The campus daycare was too expensive, so she found an affordable one off campus. But if Caleb got sick or the daycare was closed, she'd have to scramble. Had a few meltdown. Friends sometimes watched him or she'd bring him to class. Once a professor held Caleb while delivering a lecture. But even then, when I did have meetings on campus or whatever, I had to bring Caleb. I'm like, how am I supposed to change him? There's no change in room. And money was tight. Her scholarship covered tuition and housing. It did not cover milk, diapers, and clothes. He's another human being. I needed more money. <laughs> so she found a job at a cleaning company. Another thing to add to her crazy schedule. All while trying to graduate on time with a degree in family, youth, and community sciences. Okay, so today we're going to move on to talking about attachment relatives. On campus, Ikea is just another student, but she relishes it. It's not a burden, it's her escape. I just love it, and it's so exciting. Many of her classes in child development and psychology, they actually apply to her life. Not Kale is the experiment, but the stuff I learn in class, like I go home and try it on him and see how it works. Home, for the two of them, is an apartment on campus full of toys and books, Early readers mixed with textbooks on psychology and criminal justice. Mommy, mommy! 
homework and studying, that's done at night, and it's often interrupted. Stop singing. <laughs> I'm thinking up more books than you. It's easier now, Alpia says, since Caleb is no longer a baby. But there are new challenges. Imagine trying to study for finals and potty training a toddler. Tonight, there is another accident. Daddy, <laughs> Daddy, Mommy. Come on, why didn't you go to the rest? <laughs> but she's in the home stretch. This is the final semester of her senior year. And as we drive to drop off Caleb at daycare, a few reflects on her life in college with her son. It motivated me more to finish. It wasn't like, oh man, he's gonna slow me down. I don't want him to feel like he held me back from anything because he did it. She wants to see campuses celebrating student parents like her to help change the perception of who college is for. Remember, people do get pregnant. <laughs> and those people, given the right supports, also graduate. Ikea Parks is planning on walking across the stage this weekend to collect her bachelor's degree. Three year old Caleb will be right by her side. Alyssa Natalie, NPR News, Gainesville, Florida. Um, so that's Ikea's story, which is uh, kind of why we do all this. <laughs> Um, and these are pictures that she sent me after graduation. She decorated her cap. It says, uh, nevertheless, she persisted, and Caleb's holding a little sign, congrats, mommy. Um, so what's interesting about her story is it, it's a success for sure, but our conversation, she pointed out so many things that her college and other colleges could do better um, in terms of support, in terms of kind of giving her the tools that she needed, which I think is, are, is really interesting, especially... Um, when we talk about successes, there's still improvement there. Um, so the next story I, I want to talk about is um, something I did around financial aid. So I am always working on stories about paying for college and financial aid. That's kind of why we're all here. Um, when I talk to students, this is the number one thing they want to know about in high school. It's the number one thing they want to know about when they're in college. And when they graduate, they still want to know about all this money stuff. Um, so this was a story... Uh, about some research looking at financial aid packages. So this is when you um, are applying to schools and they kind of give you your financial situation um, in a packet. And the research looked at 11,000 letters, offer letters, and basically found that the jargon was insane. And I'm sure you, this, I think this expa uh, expands beyond just financial aid. The jargon that higher ed uses blows my mind. Um, bursar's office, some places are called bursar. <laughs> what? what? Um, I, even on, on websites, when you're talking about kind of when you'll be eligible to use your Pell and what semesters and what courses, it's like, who wrote this? <laughs> um, especially when we're talking to students who don't have any, you know, real grounding in all the stuff kind of we're talking about today, about financial literacy, about loans. Um, so, so, this, so this research was kind of all about the lingo and the jargon. Um, this slide is just an example. This is the 136 ways that colleges described this one federal loan. Yeah, it's insane. So also imagine if you're a student trying to kind of compare, the names aren't even the same. Again, this is one kind of federal loan. And many of the names actually took out the word loan. Perhaps you might argue the most important word in the definition. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there is um, legislation in Congress at the national level and some states to try and uh, make this uniform and try and make the um, language that financial aid offices use more standard. Um, so that's underway. Uh, and I talked to several congressmen on both sides, uh, Republicans and Democrats, who are pushing legislation like this. So potentially some changes coming. We will see. Um, this is the girl, McKenna Hensley, that I talked to in this story. And um, I want to make sure that we stay on schedule. So I won't play her clip, but she basically, she's just delightful. And she was kind of talking about how with loans and finances, there is this semblance that you have a lot of money that you actually don't have. And that just confused her even more. The fact that she was looking at these really big numbers, sometimes they'd be bolded or in good, like, fun fonts. And it just, it, was, it wasn't directed to kind of what that money meant, what that loan meant, or how much she would need 
um, for books or for all these extra things. So, so what she kind of talked to me about was just how um, the psychology behind the way the money was presented to her didn't really match what it actually meant. Um, so one of the things that came out of this story um, was we put together this glide, uh, this glossary slash guide um, on, on, this, on these terms because there are just so many terms that students need to know. So this, this is just an example of one of the ways that we're trying to kind of take stories and transform them into like news you can use. Um, so, and, and I'll share all of these links and resources with you guys so that you can use them and share them. Um, and this brings me to our latest project that we've been working on at NPR. It's called Life Kit. It's a podcast um, that is essentially news you can use. So drawing from the reporting that we've done, the research that we've covered, the students that we've talked to, we're trying to package it into podcasts that you can listen to and like use. There's tons of really good ones on um, budgeting and finance and credit cards. Um, this is a really, really great resource, and it's kind of like finally. Um, NPR has just amassed so much knowledge and information. We've talked to so many experts across the board, so this is a, a place to put it all. Um, this guide came out last week. It's about paying for college. It's super timely uh, for this conference. Um, there's three episodes within it. One is about what you need to know before you go to college. So this is loans. This is what questions to ask who to seek out on campus. Um, there's one about once you do graduate, how do you pay everything back? So like tons of repayment advice, um, consolidation advice, so lots of like post-school questions. And actually, to be honest, even if you leave school and you didn't get a degree and you still got loans, great, great resource, because we know kind of based on, on uh, research, those are actually the folks that we should be really concerned about, the ones who have a little bit of college, they have loans, and they didn't get their degree. Uh, those are often the ones most likely de to default. Um, and then the, the third one is kind of what to do in college. That's, um, I think, kind of fun because we, we only talked with students. So it's kind of like it's for students by students, um, and it's their advice on how to navigate college when you're paying for yourself, by yourself. Um, let's see if I have a... So this is what that episode looks like here. Um, I'm going to play a little bit of it, but one thing I want to just tell you before I play a clip is that the anecdote at the top, so I'm always looking for students um, and kind of good characters. Um, the person that I highlighted in this, her name is Lauren Shandevel. She goes to the University of Michigan. Her university put out this affordability guide. What you need to know about money when you're in college is from the student government. And they launched it, she was a junior at the time, and she said, wait a second, this doesn't really resonate with me. Do they even talk to any low-income students? Like, this doesn't, this did not land. Um, the advice was sell your car, um, stop using a laundry service, um, cleaning. They talked about like basically if you have cleaning help, someone cleaning your apartment, perhaps you should not have that person cleaning your apartment. I mean, it was like so out of touch. Um, I mean, in their defense, the average student who goes to the University of Michigan, their family makes $155,000 per year. So in the college's defense, perhaps that was for the average student, you know. Um, but Lauren, it certainly wasn't for Lauren. Um, so she created a Google Doc, and she thought, oh, I will just update this with the tips that have helped me. Maybe I'll even, like, print it out and pass it around on campus, on the quad, um, cause, so other people could use it. So she starts typing up this Google Doc, and she realizes, like, she only knows the stuff that helped her. And her situation isn't the same as everybody else's situation. So she starts kind of passing the link around. She keeps the sharing settings open, and within days, there's hundreds of comments and edits and tips, where to get free food on campus, which advisors were helpful, how to get the bus route that gets you to the free clinic. I mean, it's like packed with good stuff. And so I talked to Lauren about making this, and 
through social media, other schools got word of this Google Doc and they started making their own. So uh, Pima Community College in Arizona has their own, um, University of Texas, Austin, a bunch of different schools started to make their own. So that's kind of what this story is about. And then we talked to lots of students who had contributed to the guides for ha to have them share kind of their tips and tricks. So that also could be potentially something you could do here with students to kind of crowdsource um, their tips in terms of how they navigated finances here. I think students are just like the best experts and I think we do not ask them enough for their input. And they're really smart and they know exactly what they need. Or sometimes they need you to coax exactly what they need out of them, but. Um, so this, these are some of the tips um, that came out of the guides. And I'll play you a little bit, of, a little clip of Lauren. Abia's experience helps us get to takeaway number six, take care of yourself. Like everyone talks about housing and food security and finances, which are obviously very important, but I think like a huge component of it is like that sense of belonging. Lauren experienced that. In addition to feeling stressed about money, there were moments where I was like, maybe college isn't for me. But making the Not Rich Guide, it was a big turning point for her. Economic status is such an invisible identity and there are no places on campus where we can really find each other. So I feel like that was also a huge component of the guide was that it brought together people who had experienced this before and, and students who were reading the guide knew that they weren't alone and people had gone through it. So, yeah, so that's Lauren. So yeah, I think maybe, maybe you might want to crowdsource one here. I like that idea. It's mine, so maybe that's why I like it. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about new research on federal loans. I know I'm uh, pretty close to the time, so I will make it quick here. Um, basically, researchers found that uh, when they looked at community college students who were using Pell, so these are folks who are, would not be using loans to cover tuition, um, they found they were more likely to matriculate for the next semester and um, more likely to get better grades. So it, the study has not been around long enough to see the impact on graduation, but I just thought this was interesting and kind of important to note in, time, in our conversation around loans and kind of the importance of loans. Again, these were very small federal loans, so the best type of loan that you can borrow, um, but they had um, an impact on grades and retention. So um, kind of worth noting and, and putting into the conversation with students. Um, and then here's just a little tease at what my breakout session will be later this afternoon, um, which is kind of a look at what other colleges and universities are doing around financial literacy. Um, there's a couple centers that have popped up. Campuses have classes. Um, and so I talked with some of those professors and campus leaders to um, get some advice on what you guys should know. Um, and then, of course, talking about money can be really uncomfortable. So they recommended some games and exercises and tips for making students at ease when talking about their financial situation. So, that's all. Thank you guys so much, I really appreciate it.